Right. Hold up one more minute. It's people are filtering in and then Okay. Are you gonna sort of how uh communicative are we gonna be uh, back and forth at the start or we can be very communicative, um it's completely up to you. Okay. I I'm here all the way through, so don't worry, I'm not gonna switch off with you or anything That's like fine. that. Just um fine. No, everything's sort of done my end, so yeah, I'll be here throughout. Cool. I can't believe how noisy those cleaners are being. No. I say I'm quite impressed by how quiet my house is being at the moment, but we'll see how it goes. I know what they're like. But yeah, I think we'll get going. Um, I just want to say thank you for everyone for turning up today. Um, well, this evening, really. This is Colour Management, and it is in association with um, x Right today, and it's being hosted by Ollie Kensington, so thank you very much for being here. We do appreciate it. Um, okay. And I'm going to hand this over to you. Thank you very much, Lucy. So, um, hello, everyone. Good evening. Um, yes, so colour management and X Right. Those of you who uh, have seen me talk before or, or know my work um, probably quite closely associate me with. X right. Um, bizarrely, my relationship with X right began through CVP, uh, the complete opposite way around of right now, um, several years ago when um, CVP asked me to make a video for their blog. They just relaunched their blog, and uh, and I said, sure. What, what should I do on this? Like, do, do anything. Do do it on anything you want, really. And I had happened to have just bought the X right color checker video, which had just come out, and I was like, well. I'd, I'd, I'll do a little quick blog about how to use that chart and uh, ended up on CVP's blog and then XWrite saw it and emailed me a few days later and said they'd seen it and uh, told me that they had learnt loads, which, which still makes me laugh. <laughs> um, I realised now what they meant was like their marketing department who had seen it had, had learnt loads. I was like, I'm sure I haven't taught XWrite how to use their own product. Um, but I hope it, not. Uh, <laughs> but um, they, uh, yeah, they asked me there and then if I wanted to work with them and uh, be uh, an ambassador. Um, I mainly said yes because they call us Colorati ambassadors, and I think that sounds really cool. Um, so I was like, yeah, I'm a Colorati now. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, their products are fantastic, and color management's at the heart of everything that I do. Um, uh, I'm uh, predominantly a colorist by trade, and that's what I spend most of my days doing. Uh, I occasionally pick up a camera as well. And um, that kind of end-to-end -end, uh, workflow for me is really important and making sure that the imagery that we are delivering to our clients is the best that it can be, but also quite selfishly that the process of getting there is as easy as possible. And um, that sort of permeates through everything that we do from the equipment that we choose um, to uh, you know which can be from monitors to cameras to lights um, and and one of the things and I still get tickled by the fact that it's one of the most basic and you know relatively cheap things as well one of the things that ties that all together is the humble 
chart, the X-ray um, color checker video char um, charts themselves, which are at the, the heart of that whole pipeline, really. Um, and the reason why they're so good is they give a consistent reference that ties everything together. So we'll, we're going to be going through what is on the chart, you know, why it's there and, and what those uh, references are. But well, I'll be kind of giving you tips as we go along about how you can use them. I think too often people just think, well, I'll buy a chart and I'll hold it up in my next thing that I'm shooting and record a few seconds of it. And, and there we go. That's it. Everything's done. There's actually quite a lot that you can do with the chart um, before you've even hit record to capture it. It's that point of capture is the point where you're taking a snapshot of that chart to come with you to post-production. And, and I'll be showing you that end of things uh, later. But before you even hit record, you have the opportunity to use the chart to assist you with exposure. Um, and that can uh, obviously make a huge difference, particularly if you're in a multicam environment. And, and also with the, the normal or small size charts, you've also got the white balance component as well, which can help you make sure that your white balance is correct. Um, it was, you know, a bit of a revelation to me when I first started uh, using these charts in earnest and, and properly white balancing from them and moving away from auto white balance or actually more uh, likely was um, uh, turning my lights on, my artificial lights, um, and rating them at whatever, you know, let's say putting them on daylight presets and then manually dialing in that same Kelvin into my camera. Um, that that moment where I realized that that wasn't helping me and that that extra step of just pressing the white balance button, um, the difference that that made, it's it's incredible. And it still kind of blows my mind to this to this day, really, that how um, infrequently um, I see people doing a manual white balance um, to, to the point where I believe that a, a few people actually and there are DPs that think that it's almost kind of, uh, you know, a badge of honor to be able to just kind of look and go, I think today I'm going to dial in this Kelvin. Um, it's just kind of crazy, particularly if you're working with natural light, but even with artificial lights, even if in a completely enclosed environment with only studio lighting, which is what we have here, for example. Um, not only is this a blacked out, uh, spectrally flat uh, color reference environment, with the exception of the brick wall behind me, um, it's also more or less the sun's gone now as well. So it's, there's, there's no daylight coming in at all. The only lights also have uh, on in this space right now is this tungsten bulb behind me, which is just for show, um, just to give a bit of interest, in, interest to a boring wall. Um, but the main um, key I have here is a Gemini one by one, which is just set to 6,500 Kelvin, which matches the um, white point of all of the other lights that we use in our, um, in our studio here. So even if you're in an environment like this, you will still see benefits to white balancing properly rather than just guessing. So this light's rated at 6,500 right now, but I would still manually white balance. Um, We'll talk more about why that is later on. I want to start with exposure. And uh, exposure is a fundamental, obviously. Um, cameras are very good these days. You can be quite far uh, under or overexposed and still pull the image back successfully without introducing too many uh, problems to the image. One of the things that I'm always careful to stress is just because there is margin for error just because you might have a camera that's particularly good at recovering details if it's uh, over or underexposed it doesn't mean that it's still not beneficial to not have to do those things it's a big part of this is time saving and uh, when we're talking about time savings i'm not just talking about getting home earlier uh, i'm not just talking about you know billing your client for uh, the time that you said it was going to be but actually you managed to get away quicker um, although those things are great um, Really, for me, it's more about reinvestment of that time. So taking those gains through kind of disciplined color management and taking those gains in terms of time and then reinvesting them. And it can be something simple. It could be just reinvesting that in another pass. Um, I, I don't think there's ever been a time where I've colored anything um, and not come back with fresh eyes and made it better. Um, and of course, that requires time because you have to give yourself that time to go. Uh, it could even be overnight. It could be you, you sleep on it and come back the next day, or it could just be a break. Um, but if you haven't got that time, then you never get that opportunity. It could be the time that you get to 
pull out a few extra bells and whistles that you wouldn't have otherwise had to do. It could be that that time is reinvested um, in uh, letting the client have an additional round of amendments. Um, it could be that that time is reinvested in actually just finishing early and maybe you exceed expectations if it's on a tight deadline. Um, that's, that's also you know, worth its weight in gold as well. But those things are all going to come about with just a little bit of discipline whilst you're uh, in production uh, just to take a few steps. So the, um, on the point of exposure, if we are um, pointing our camera at pretty much anything, I'm just going to randomly point it at a chair because there's not a huge amount to <laughs> point at where I am right now. Um, I've also realized that my clip mic, the, uh, I, was, I was shooting yesterday and um, my client very helpfully helped me pack up but um, had left my uh, um, uh, receiver um, plugged and turned on so the batteries run run uh, dead on that one so uh, i'm sort of tied to where my uh, yeti is so i'm going to try in a minute to kind of move this main cam and turn it around and put the on-screen displays on and actually let you see what's going on in the camera whilst i'm pointing it at the charts um but when it comes to exposure there's uh, the kind of the basic idea of obviously making sure you've got a well exposed image but there's also uh, the added complication which comes these days of you know um what do you do if you're shooting log, you know, how do you expose if you're in a certain log curve? What if you're not in log, but you're in some kind of uh, hybrid um, gamma that's not quite f sort of full Rec. 7 and 9, but also not log. So on the Canons that I use, we have wide DR, which brings in a little bit of extra information at the top and uh, lowers the 90% reflectance uh, white point, it drops down. Um, how can you deal with those changing gammas? How, how does the chart help with that? Um, and the other thing that uh, you need to bear in mind is if you're shooting multicam, uh, even slight differences in exposure between cameras can really jar once you're looking at them. So getting those very close is very useful. And also if you get that benchmark right in camera, if there are subtle differences um, between the cameras, the way that they plot from black to white, or even major differences, you might be using a completely different gamma uh, on two different cameras. Um, by making sure that you've got that benchmark, that reference, which I'll talk to you about in a moment with 90%, it means that you know that at least one part of the curve is, is matched up, and then you can kind of intelligently figure out where the curve deviates from one camera to the other. So we'll talk about all of those different things and, and, and how you can use the charts for that. Um, the thing I'm going to start off doing, and this is where it's going to probably not look great, is I'm just going to hop up. I'm going to drift away from the microphone so you're not going to be able to hear me very well. Um, I'm going to grab the chart. I'm going to set it up over there, turn on a new, another light uh, and grab the camera. And I'm just going to show you um, the sort of basic things that I can do to help with exposure. So bear with me two yes. seconds. Cool. If you guys have any questions at all, please feel free to just pop them in the chat. Um, I think you can wave your hand or um, pop them in the Q&A and we'll make sure that they're answered. Got a very squeaky face pattern there. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm going I'm to make you all seasick now. Let's get this on. Right, so let's come down here. Hopefully you can all see that and you can still hear me. Let me know if you have something yeah. going wrong. It's all good at the moment. Let me just... Right, okay. So uh, I've just plonked the chart down on our editor's vacant chair at the moment. And I'm going to turn on now, I'm going to turn on the on-screen displays. There we go. So you should now all be able to see the, um, all the various different bits and pieces. Unfortunately, with the camera I'm using at the moment, um, it won't output the waveform monitor over the HDMI. So there's a, a, a big gap uh, in the on-screen display where I can see on the camera the waveform. Um, but you can't see that, so um, you'll have to bear with me for that one. So the first thing I'm going to do, you, you should actually be able to see there on the left-hand side, it says YDR. So I'm currently in the YDR gamma. Just to um, make things nice and simple, I'm actually just going to come in. I'm just going to stick that into the Rec. 7 and 9 standard, which is slightly different. You'll see the image change ever so slightly. And 
what I'm going to do is I'm going to expose the camera. There we go. Um, based on what I know about the curve that I've just chosen, which was uh, Rec 7 and 9 standard, and uh, what I know about the chart. So the first thing to bear in mind is that this chart is um, uh, split into this kind of three distinct sections. So we've got the left hand side, we've got those uh, um, skin tone chips on the left hand side. We've also got a uh, sort of a gradient uh, graduated uh, number of chips from uh, black to white. We've got the big main section in the middle, which is the one that I'm mainly using now. And then on the right hand side, we've got the saturated and desaturated chromaticity references for Rec 7 and 9, which we'll come back to uh, more in post. So the reason why this middle section is so big is it's to make it easier to see on things like waveform monitors, uh, zebras, any kind of assistive um, tools that you're using. Um, as I say, with this camera right now, I've got the waveform monitor on. I, I think, let me see actually, I should, I don't know, this might not work, <laughs> but I think I should be able to put on my zebras as well. So if I set this to 90. Just incidentally, this may or may not work. I, what I'm not sure will work is if when I turn zebras on, if you'll actually see the pattern uh, coming across the HDMI, you might not. But whether you do or you don't, let me just explain one thing here, because this is possibly one of the more popular ways of, of using these charts. Um, if you have zebras in your camera, which a lot of, uh, or pretty much all cinema cameras do, but a lot of um, mirrorless and DSLR cameras do as well, you sometimes get presented with two types um, here I've got the option Zebra 1, Zebra 2, or 1 and 2. Uh, and there's sometimes confusion about what the difference between those is. It doesn't help that often Zebra 1 is pre-selected as well. Um, you can actually see the differences between them if you look at the two options beneath. So we have a Zebra 1 level and a Zebra 2 level, and you'll notice the Zebra 1 level has a plus minus next to it. That's the crucial difference between these two. Zebra 1 gives you a range. So it's very useful for seeing a range uh, of um, brightness. So you can determine, for example, um, it might be around middle gray. So you might set this to plus or, f uh, plus or minus 5% uh, and see slightly under and slightly over middle gray. Or 70% if this was pointing at uh, someone with uh, Caucasian skin, 70% um, plus or minus 5% is quite useful for gauging a typically well exposed um, Caucasian face. There's all kinds of reasons why you might choose to use Zebra 1, but it is by its nature a range. What I'm doing here is I'm trying to set exposure based on a very specific reference white value. And the reference white value I'm going by is this top. Um, I can't point because um, I'll then have to move away from the uh, microphone, but the top white um, uh, chip, as we call them. Um, and that is a very specific 90% reflectance, which um, correlates with 90 IRE uh, when you are exposing it. So if I come back into that menu, Whereas Zebra 1 is kind of useful, it's great for sh seeing a range. Here I don't want a range, I want a very definitive, is it 90% or not? The other difference between these two is with Zebra 1, the Zebra pattern will appear as it approaches that, um, uh, that number, so from plus or minus 5% either side. But when it's under that uh, plus or minus 5% or over, it disappears again. So you see the pattern come on and then disappear again. So you might be um, over or under and not necessarily know which. So you might have, you end up kind of scrolling back and forth your exposure trying to find where that range lives. Whereas with Zebra 2s, as soon as you're at or above that level, the pattern appears and it stays there. So it's also uh, easier to work with in that sense. So I'm going to set this to Zebra 2. I've got it set to a Zebra 2 level of 90% because that should correlate with the 90% reflectance uh, chip at the top. And if I turn on my zebras, and this is the bit where I don't think it's going to appear. No, unfortunately, it doesn't appear on your side. Um, I can now see that on my side. So if I, uh, I'm just going to uh, bring my exposure down. Um, my light source is just very slightly left of center. You probably can't pick that up uh, over the interweb, um, but it's ever so slightly brighter because the light is just slightly to the left of the center of the, of the chart. So my zebra pattern is actually appearing on pretty much all of that white chip, um, but it's kind of disappeared by the time it's got over to the, uh, to the right hand edge. Um, what I would want to do is I'd want to adjust my exposure until the zebra pattern is 
um, just starting to appear on the brightest part of that um, because if it's if it's fully on over that whole left hand side and just start starting to taper out on the right that um, if you remember I just said it comes on and it stays on so I might have that bright side at actually 95 96 percent it may even be over that um, uh, and and I you know you might end up with it too bright so it's better to have it sort of slightly down if I expose there I'm at f3.5 there's no zebra pattern at all on that chip if I come just up to 3.2 it's just starting to appear on the left hand side so actually that's probably a good place to leave it um, now what's cool about um, the zebras is it's a nice visual easy reference you see the little lines uh, appear on your screen and they're easy to turn on and off or, or even leave on um, but if, if I'm using them I just turn them on when I'm doing this type of work and then just turn them off um, afterwards so um, the zebra is a perfectly legitimate way of doing that I'm going to turn mine off. Um, I've also got a waveform monitor up. Again, apologies, it's not appearing on your screen, it's only appearing on mine. Um, but I can see that same information here. It's not as precise because um, the zebras are working on a <coughs> pixel by pixel basis. Whereas here um, with the waveform monitor, it's a bit more kind of vague. It's also just smaller on the screen to see. But if you are used to using waveform monitors, it's, it's pretty um, easy to guess. Uh, sorry, to get it pretty near to the, to the right area. Um, one of the reasons why this middle section is so big is it makes it easy to actually follow. If I move the camera left and right because of the way that a waveform works, it's actually really easy to see which part of my scope relates to that top uh, white chip. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sometimes if... Uh, um, if I've got a, you know, a, a um, model or uh, someone we're interviewing, if they're holding the chart, I would just, and I'm struggling to see where it is in the waveform, um, I just ask them to move, move it left and right. So rather than me moving the camera left and right, I just ask them to move the chart left and right. And it can help you spot where that line is. There aren't going to be very many things that are such a uniform, flat, bright white in your scene probably and that's kind of the whole point of charts is they contain references that don't typically exist in reality um, and therefore and, and they're also predictable so they, they appear and it doesn't matter how many charts you buy they'll always be exactly the same so um, but anyway the waveform monitor is showing me uh, my IRE scale I can see the um, uh, the white chip at the top and I can see the left hand edge of it is just touching 90 and I can see it kind of curving and sloping off slightly in the right hand edge so over on um, if I get it up here so over on this side up on the other um, up on the right hand edge that edge is just slightly dipping down that's actually hitting around about 75 80 and then the left hand edge over there is is not so that's another useful thing that this chart can do it can actually help you if you're trying to get equal um illumination across a subject um you can you can also check that i can see very clearly in the waveform that it's dropping off on one side anyway so that um confirms my exposure now with ydr i know that a 90 percent reflectance in ydr it will drop to 75 ire so it goes from 90 to 75. Uh, i know that in c log it will then drop again it will drop down to 60. Um, you know there are different um, points that will drop to and what's nice is if you go to any camera manufacturer's website they almost always have a white paper that um, shows you what the um, reference 90% white point where it goes to for a given curve so for example if I needed to know what 90% uh, white turns to when I'm in S log 2 I could go to Sony's website I could find the white paper for S log and it would show me and in fact uh, S log 2 I believe is uh, 59 IRE um, and uh, S log 3 is 61 they're all roughly around kind of 60 typically for those kind of log curves but if you're trying to do something very precisely you can actually find that information out having said that if you can't be bothered <laughs> uh, and, and quite frankly most of us do have better things to do um, then a really simple trick uh, that, that I love showing people because it's uh, it really is just one of those kind of very simple things is if I am wanted to shoot this scene Let's say, I mean, this scene isn't a high dynamic range scene at all. I'm in a dark space. <laughs> that 90% reflectance is the brightest thing that I'm seeing right now. But if I was in a high dynamic range location, my scene was quite high dynamic range. There was kind of a good 14, 15, 16 stops of, of dynamic range within the scene. 
Um, obviously, my camera will only really be able to capture that many stops of dynamic range by using a log curve. So rather than sticking your camera straight into that log curve and then trying to remember, oh, you know, damn it, where is it that Ollie said 90% reflectance drops to in S log 2? Rather than doing that, what you can do very easily is just do everything I've just shown you and then change the curve. <laughs> it's, it's really, really simple. So I've exposed it correctly based on the Rec 709 curve. If I now go into wide DR, you can see instantly that the image has changed. In fact, what I'll do is I'll just turn the on-screen display off and do that again so that you're, in case it's hard to tell. Um, has it gone? That. Let's come back in here. Right, so let's go back to where I was. There's normal. And then if I go into YDR, can you see that white chip at the top? It's dropping down. Yeah. Now, the reason why that's happening is because YDR um, is exactly the same as Rec. 709 up until the top. <laughs> so what it's doing is it's pulling down um, and, and reducing the amount um, that bright areas will disappear off the top. Because Rec. 709 is, as a gamma curve, is, you know, it's only for a very limited amount of dynamic range. Uh, YDR is really good because it actually gives you everything from sort of middle gray or just above middle gray down. It plots the same as Rec. 709. And then as you move up from middle gray, it's, it's bringing those down just slightly a bit like a log curve would, but it's not a log curve and it doesn't need grading. So if you look at everything from sort of that um, second chip down, let me turn it back off again. You should notice that literally nothing, so the gray chip that's directly underneath that white one, that is middle gray. So that's 18% reflectance, which is about 45 IRE. Um, you'll notice it's not changing. The only thing that's changing is that white chip at the top. And that's because this curve brings down those top um, highlights that are above middle gray and brings them down. So I'm going from 90 IRE uh, and that 90% reflectance chip is now sitting at 75 IRE. And I can see that reflected on my waveform monitor. And if I were to turn on my um, zebras, I could do that. So like I said, if I, if I know that in advance, then there's no reason why I couldn't set my zebra twos to 75% uh, or just um, you know, go into it already in YDR. Uh, and, you know, and often I do because I do know that. But if you're just getting used to where the different values are or you don't want to have to remember them, um, then you can just set it up in Rec. 709 in a standard curve um, it's easy to remember because that 90% reflectance sits at 90 IRE, so you don't have to remember different sets of numbers. And then once you've done it, once you've exposed it, you then change your gamma. If I carry on going, so if I now move from wide DR to log. Can I ask is, a quick question? Yes. Is that all right? Yeah, um, no, please do. Um, if your camera displays the LUT for viewing on the camera, can you yep. use that for your 90%? Sorry if that's jumping around for you. No, 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 no. That's a really good question. Um, almost in most circumstances, when people have LUTs on, it's just a display LUT. So it's just showing a, um, a transformed image on the uh, monitor or the EVF. And um, it's not actually... Uh, being recorded to the card. Now, some cameras you can make it so it's actually recording and burning that in. Um, but certainly on the Canon cameras I use, if you were to turn on a, uh, a display LUT in the camera, the waveform monitor wouldn't be affected at all and neither would your zebras. Those are always reading from the sensor. And so they are independent of what gamma curve that you're, you're using. Uh, and the reason for that is exactly uh, demonstrated here because they, they were um, then it, you would get conflicting results and everything would be shifting around constantly. So your waveform monitor should uh, always show you exactly what the sensor is seeing uh, rather than um, changing. So uh, if they're talking about a display LUT, um, so they're shooting log but they're, and they're just monitoring with a LUT on, um, then there, it would be no different from what I've described. You, you, you could still use the zebras and the waveform um, and it would still be showing you accurately what the sensor was seeing, not what the display is showing you. Um, um, we just had another question, is why DR the same as um, HDR and Sony? It's not, as, it's not the same, is it? As HDR? Yeah. Um, no, it's not, no, it's not uh, an HDR related, it, and they might be, in, unless they're referring to HLG, which is an HDR curve, um, 
in which case it's kind of similar. The old, the, ultimately, what you end up looking at isn't too dissimilar. Um, it's about um, capturing a wide dynamic range. The, the key thing with HLG, if that's what they're talking about, is that it is a, uh, a curve that uh, any HDR display would automatically plot correctly and give you a, an HDR look without you having to grade it. Whereas if you shot something in wide DR, it, um, it, it's not doing the same thing. If you watch that back on an HDR screen, it wouldn't look HDR. Um, so I kind of, if that's what they're talking about, I can kind of see why they, they might be thinking that. Um, and HLG, Jane, sorry? I can send um, um, a bit more information on that. Um, we've yeah. got some um, videos and stuff that if you're interested in, I can cool, send cool. those through. Um, we are getting quite a few questions. Are you good for a couple more? Do you want yeah, to yeah, carry yeah, on? Yeah, my way. Yeah. That's great. Um, um, but, Sorry for the One. boring shot of the chart. Yeah. Here. No, it's, it's very, it's got, it's got colours on, you're going well. <laughs> um, but if you use an external monitor and use the, the out on the monitor end, is that a good way to, way to exposure with the tools you are talking? And I've got lots. So, Sorry. say that again. <laughs> yeah. But if you use an external monitor and yep. use the out on the monitor end, I think it's supposed to say LUT on the monitor end. Is that a good way to, for the exposure with the tools you are talking? Yeah, I mean, it's no different from what I was just saying, whether you, because some cameras, so you can, most cameras will let you choose whether that LUT appears on the built-in EVF or um, comes out on the SDI and follows down to whatever you've got hooked up to the SDI. Um, it, in, in any event, what you um, should have with most cameras is that that LUT is simply for display purposes. It's just so that when you look at it, it looks roughly like uh, the uh, like like a linear image would look. Um, it sh that shouldn't be affecting the uh, waveform. Now there would be an exception to this if you had that LUT. Um, being sent out of out of the SDI, so that your image is coming out the SDI on your camera with that LUT, and then plug that into a monitor, and uh, that monitor doesn't know that that's got a LUT on it. So that monitor's built-in scopes would be showing you the LUTed image, if that makes sense. So that's why with things like the Atmos cameras, you can send out a a clean log image, and then the the, the uh, monitor itself you can say oh actually I'm sending you a C log or an S log or whatever it might be an image and then it will then go oh okay and it will transform it for you but it will still then understand that that's not what actually what it's receiving and it's built in tools and scopes will be correctly showing you the same information as the cameras you know waveform or whatever it is so um, yeah it depends on the monitor so that the, the, the Atomoses do that quite handle that quite nicely mm. but you might have one that just says oh look at this SDI signal here's your waveform and it doesn't understand that actually there's a LUT baked into that signal coming out of the SDI um, if in any doubt just use the waveform monitor on your camera that should always show you the sensor readout oh, that's great and then um, one more I yep. promise and um, I've got one from James I tend to shoot on 3000 200k or 5600k depending if i'm lighting with tungsten or daylight i then use gels to change color of my scene would dialing would dialing setting white balance from a chart be better than sticking to 32 slash 56 um so what i would yeah it, there's a lot of variables in there but mm. um if you're um what you want to always do because and i get this question asked a fair bit you know what what if i'm at a disco and there's lots of blue lights you can't white balance to the blue lights um you you always want to try and white balance to a baseline um if you're lighting a scene predominantly with tungsten uh but then you're gelling certain things maybe you're gelling a practical in the scene or you're adding a gel to something that's pushing a sort of a color into the background you still want to white balance to the to your to your baseline if you like if you like and then and then filter from there um it does you know this does vary as you go up and this this is far more important if you're using dslrs and cameras that have very small you know very little wiggle room for manipulation in post as you start moving up with with cameras that have got far more robust codecs um the the You'll, you'll see less impact or less variance when you start doing this. Um, so for example, I wouldn't be too uh, dismayed if I was um, you know, doing a lot of stuff like that and I was using a camera with a very big 
you know, uh, headroom on the top of it. It's, it, you have to be more disciplined, the kind of the cheaper and, and less capable the camera is, which is a kind of ironic. It means people who are starting out with the cheaper uh, sort of cameras, because that's all they can afford. They actually have to be far more disciplined than people who are further along with their career. But uh, um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of variables in that question. But uh, if they want to know more specifics for a, a setup that they're working with, then, then they can um, contact me afterwards. Um, yeah. So the key point I just wanted to get across basically is this, the, the chart here is, is giving me a, a very accurate reference of 90% reflectance. Yes, you could probably use a white piece of paper. The, th you know, the, the point with people who go, I, I, you know, and I, I had someone once who famously said, oh, I just white balance on any white van that goes past. <laughs> they did a lot of documentary yeah. stuff and sort of street, street work. I was like, okay. Um, you know, white balancing, setting exposure, but you, you can find things in reality that kind of are almost right. But if they're, if they're even slightly not right, then the whole thing goes wrong. Um, the nice thing about these charts is they're completely predictable. I know that this is always going to be 90% reflectance. Um, doesn't matter which chart I pick up from x right, they're all exactly the same. So it's, a, it's that consistency that you're after. Um, now that I have it set and the exposure is correct, I can actually move to any of my curves. I can go into YDR, I can go into Canon Log, uh, and then this is Canon Log 3. And you can see now that the blacks are starting to change, the image is changing quite considerably, because these gamma curves are doing you know, different things. Can, once you move from YDR to Canon Log, your black point comes up, you're getting even more detail in highlights. Once you move up to Canon Log 3, your um, uh, black point stays where it is, uh, the same as Canon Log, but then your white point is coming down even further. So each of them is designed to obviously give you different, to, to cover different dynamic range in your scene, which is great. Um, but as I said at the beginning, if you if you're you know if you've got a great memory and you want to memorise all of the different levels that these drop to, then then that's absolutely fantastic. But if you, if you don't, then you don't need to. All you need to remember is ninety. Get it exposed in the standard Rec Seven and Nine curve, and then you can move through and change your gamma afterwards, which is really nice. Another nice thing that you can do is you can, um, so for example, let's say that you wanted, you had a camera that you knew liked to be um, overexposed. Um, you know, there are certain cameras um, from certain manufacturers that respond particularly well uh, and do a better job at handling noise if you overexpose them by a stop or two stops. Um, if you're trying to do that, and I'm going to kind of simulate that, um, uh, oh, actually, I probably can't simulate that with this particular lens because it's not a particularly fast lens. But what I could do is I could put two stops of ND on and then go through the processes again. So if I had a faster lens, I could open this up to like 1.8 or, or, or 2 or something like that. Um, and uh, I can then uh, set my exposure and then take those two stops of ND off at the end. And then I know I'm exactly two stops overexposed. Um, or if you wanted one stop, you could stick a one stop um, ND on the front of the lens. Same thing, just expose 90 to 90, set your gamma correctly, take the ND off, and there you've got a perfectly exposed one stop over image. Um, there's a couple of different sort of combinations there, but you know, they're, they're all different ways that you can um, sort of predictably set exposure, essentially. Um, the uh, exposure being set, let's assume that we're now done with that exposure, um, uh, is kind of the first part. The, um, the next part would be to, um, to white balance. Now, I'm just going to grab a, a different chart. I've got one here. So I'm just going to grab the slightly smaller one, which has got the white balance side on it. Yeah. So, as I said, um, it's often the case that people just assume that... Um, you know, if you're in a if you're in an environment like I'm in like I'm in here, where I'm using lights that are a specific color temperature, um, I'm, the light that I've got on on the chart at the moment is a <clears throat> is a color sweep light, uh, so media light. So it's um, exactly six thousand five hundred Kelvin, very very precise, ninety nine CRI. Um, you know, as lights go, it's it's very 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 predictably six thousand five hundred Kelvin. It has to be for um, color reference environments. So when I, if I white balance this, it's not me saying I don't trust this light. It's saying I don't know what other sources in this room that light is bouncing off and then landing on my subject. So the chart is 
where my subject is. So let's pretend the chair is my subject right now. I wouldn't do this somewhere else in the room because then I'm taking a reading from somewhere else. I need to be where the talent is, where the, where the, the subject is. And the, the chart needs to be in the light that's on that subject. And because, you know, I've got a brick wall, for example, behind me here. Now, the whole room is set up so that that's behind me. So it's never in my field of vision when we're grading. Um, and we don't have any direct lights on it. And that tungsten light you saw earlier, I only turn on when, you know, just for a bit of interest when I'm doing these sorts of things. Um, but nonetheless, that's going to be, uh, in this case, if I'm shooting in here, I would still need to manually white balance the camera because the light is hitting the chart from that light source that's 6,500 Kelvin, but it's also hitting the wall and it's hitting, you know, various other objects. There's a, a box for a microphone over there. It's got a bit of blue in it. You know, all of that light is bouncing off and then it's coming back and it's, it's ultimately landing on my subject. In fact, when we do this, uh, when I, uh, <laughs> many, many moons ago, when I used to do this in the flesh with people um, at CVP, those of you who have been to CVP's Newman Street, um, you'll know that they've got these lovely uh, old original wooden floors. And they're this very deep yellow, um, sort of ochre yellow color. And uh, when we do exactly this, what I'm doing now with you in that room, it's always um, quite funny. We, I, I normally sort of let people kind of lead me. So I say, well, here's a white balance chart. We're going to white balance the camera. Um, what's the first thing I should do? And normally people go, oh, yeah, well, let's turn the lights off. And they'll turn the lights, you know, the sort of the tungsten lights that are in the room off. And there's two big windows with daylight pouring in. And I'm like, right, OK, so we're going to white balance. We're going to measure the temperature of the daylight. And... Um, uh, uh, and people and I normally say to people, well, if we were just going to dial this in, what would we dial it in as? And you know, people will come back with five five or five thousand six hundred Kelvin because it's all this daylight coming in these windows, and there's no other light source. Um, and of course, when you manually balance the camera from the uh, white balance card on the X right, uh, what you quickly discover is that it's a million miles away because you've got the yellow uh, floor. So this daylight's coming in, bouncing off this really warm floor and then hitting your subject. So actually that warms it up massively. Um, and the other thing is that the daylight that comes in, it's a north facing windows, although they're two big windows, they're north facing and um, the light that comes in is really cool. And I've measured the white uh, temperature in that room before as 9,000 Kelvin. And the people that were on uh, that particular <laughs> workshop just didn't believe it. Um, but there's a, I think it's Bureau Happold or something. There's a building on the other side of the uh, road that's the, actually painted. Yeah, something very, like that. Yeah, yeah, it's very dark gray blue. And so you've got a north facing window with light that's kind of bouncing off this bluey gray building and then bouncing in through the windows. It's incredible um, what a difference it makes to the, to the light source that's in your room. So basically you can't ever guess. So I'm gonna take my camera and I'm just gonna move it over here. I might, I might be fuzzy in the corner there. Um, and move the microphone around so you can still hear me. And I'm gonna uh, fill the screen. I'm also going to just make sure that I'm not overexposing. If I um, expose too brightly, then uh, I can accidentally clip one of my color channels. So for example, it's not very bright right now. Let me just, I'm just going to deliberately sort of brighten it up. So there, just put it at 1600 ISO. Um, it's still under 100 IRE, so it's still technically in but the waveform monitor on my camera is a Luma waveform. So it's showing an, an average. It's not taking into account that the, the three separate color channels. And it's very simple, actually, particularly at this brightness for one of those color channels. It could be blue, it could be green, it could be red, to actually be clipping. And if you tell a camera to white balance from something that's clipped and it's missing information in that part of the signal, then obviously your, uh, your white balance is then gonna be wrong. So we want to make sure that just whilst we're white balancing, that this uh, white balance gray reference side is somewhere around the middle, as long as it's not too near the top, that's the main thing. On my camera, I've, um, I'm gonna set it, it's currently on a, a preset here. I'm gonna stick it in one of the either A or B slots. Let's stick it in A. Oh, no, let's stick it in B in fact, there we go. And I'm gonna fill the screen as best as possible. I'm gonna press the button. You'll see it blinking down in the bottom left-hand corner. And let's now move this back over here. Put the camera back down. Okay. 
Right. So we've now got 5,700. Hang on. I turned my on screen display off, didn't I? Yeah. Silly boy. Let me turn that back on. There's me saying you can see it blinking down in the bottom left hand corner. Right. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> um, so in the bottom left hand corner, you should now see it says B because I stuck it into slot B. There's two slots normally you have an A and a B. Um, and it was on that. So that was uh, that was just me kind of dialing it in essentially because uh, the lights are in here are six five. Um, but from actually measuring it, it's actually five, um, 5,710. And it's also, you can see there, plus 2cc. So what that plus 2cc is, that's a color correction. So that's actually a tint adjustment. That's a green magenta tint. So it's taking into account that uh, there's actually a slight uh, pinkiness to it. And I think it's a pinkiness. Let me just, uh, I always forget it's the wrong way around compared to most lights. So as it goes up, I know, so it's green. So as I go up, it's getting more magenta. So it must be too green. So it's picking up, if I go back, it's actually picking up that there's a little bit of green from somewhere, God knows where. Uh, and it's counteracting that by adding in a plus two um, CC or plus two magenta. So bearing in mind, the only light source that's on this chart right now is a very, very highly color accurate 6,500 Kelvin bulb. You can see exactly what I was talking about. There's actually obviously a fair amount of warmth that's being bounced back onto it from the brick wall. And that's bringing that uh, Kelvin down. That's come, um, I mean, that's almost a daylight, um, a, you know, normal kind of 5556 five, daylight from a 6,500 Kelvin bulb. So you can see what a huge impact that's having. God knows where the green's coming from. I'm trying to have a think. I don't know. Well, mind you, there's that tungsten. Mm. Well, that's maybe the. Uh, sorry, I'm just even going back to the warmth. Maybe the tungsten's also bringing in. I've left that back on them behind me. I probably shouldn't have left it on. Anyway, who knows? The point is, no one knows. And if you'd see someone just waving their finger in the air on a set and, and telling you what the white balance is, just ignore them. It's just nonsense. This, this is the only way. Um, to properly tell is get a completely spectrally flat gray. So these gray um, values here are from a, um, a, I think they use graphite or something. It's completely pigment free. It's one of the few substances that can be printed that doesn't have any color in it whatsoever. So when you're white balancing from it, you're getting, you're only measuring the light and the color of that light and not some kind of pigmentation that's altering it. Um, and now that we've got that, I can then flip the chart around. and I can catch it. So we've, we've done the front of this chart already in camera to help with the exposure. We've now turned it around, we've used the white balance side to set the color temperature and the white balance correctly. And now I'm turning it back around so I can actually record and capture a few seconds of this chart, which will then come through into the uh, post-production pipeline. <clears throat> One other thing to say before I move on to the post thing, if you um, white balance from your light source, and uh, your light source is daylight, um, you can do an extra little trick. So if you've got any daylight coming into your space, daylight is uh, fluctuates. So it's not always 5,600. Um, daylight will change quite dramatically. At this time of year, it's gonna be very cool. If it goes behind thick cloud, it's gonna get easily up at seven and a half, maybe even 8,000 Kelvin, um, <clears throat> depending on the time of day as well. So if you have any natural light coming into somewhere where you're shooting, um, a good tip is to turn all of your lights off, white balance from that daylight that's coming in. Obviously, it'd be great if you could completely black it out, but you can't always do that. Just uh, white balance the way I've just shown you, and, and you're doing that just to find out what's the color temperature of that daylight coming in. Might be bouncing off a gray building on the other side of the road, you never know. And once you've found out what it is, dial your artificial lights, to match that Kelvin. So my light panels, Gemini one by ones, they're great because they go from like 2000 Kelvin to 10,000 Kelvin. So pretty much any type of quality of daylight and temperature of daylight that's coming into a space, I should be able to match um, by getting that reading from the camera and then dialing that into the lights and then or then make, making sure that you're not mixing. So the, the biggest crime you can commit is there's a window, there's light coming in, you go, oh, it's daylight, it must be 5,600 Kelvin because that's what they told me at film school or some, I heard it from someone else once. 
and then turn on your artificial light, hit the 5,600 daylight preset. And actually, you know, unknown to you, that light coming in was actually really cool. It was like 7,000 and now you've set your artificial light to 5.6 and you've instantly got a mixed light environment. So under certain circumstances, you can actually use this as a really um, convenient way to actually get an understanding of what's the color temperature of the daylight coming into your space, tune your artificial lights to match, and then you've got harmony across everything that's coming in. Uh, and that's going to get you really good uh, results. So I can now record this chart and it will then come through with me. And the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to flick across to sharing my screen. So, Ollie, um, yeah. in your opinion, um, this is this way, uh, sorry, in your opinion, this way is the way to go ahead in, to go instead of using a color meter? No problem. Let me just get the camera back up there. Um, color meters are great. Um, they're very expensive. Um, you know, this chart, what, a couple of hundred quid? Yeah. Um, less? I can't even remember. Um, and, uh, you know, a, a color meter, like the, there's a really nice Seconic one. I think they're about 1,500 quid. Um, I think if you're, if you're constantly moving between different lights and you want to get readings, I mean, particularly if you're assessing the quality of different lights and you want to get like a, you know, a, um, uh, a printout of the um, different frequencies that a light is giving off, I think those meters are absolutely invaluable. Uh, they're fantastic. But, um, you know, just in terms of normal shooting and not, you know, not having 1500 quid to spend on a, yeah. a, sort of a dedicated piece of equipment, um, this is kind of the next best thing. I mean, essentially your camera has got that technology built into it. Um, you, you know, as we've just seen, I've just pointed it at that chart, hit a button and it's telling me the temperature that it's reading, any offset of color correction that's needed. It's orienting the entire color matrix now around a correct middle point. So all of the other colors should then fall in the correct place. So um, it's not better. I mean, clearly those, those meters are great, but it's mm. more accessible what I'm doing this way. Oh, that's great, which kind of actually leads on perfectly. During this um, event, you will have received an email from me. Um, my name is Melissa Bowen. Um, obviously signed off saying Issy. Um, you, there is a promo we're running on the x right color checkers. Um, we've also got in there the X1, um, the one, I1 Display Pro Plus and some other bits and bobs and with the code X right Ollie, you get a 20% off. So it's definitely worth having a look um, at these products because they definitely help. But I want to push back to Ollie now. Thank you. Cheers. Um, yeah, 20% is great. I mean, I, I'm always amazed at how much money people spend on equipment and, uh, and they forget things like charts. I mean, it's, as I said right at the beginning, it's such a humble, basic you know dumb technology in a sense you know it's not got bat doesn't need batteries um i i have passport version in my uh backpack i have the version i've just been pointing at in my camera bag i have the extra large one which we keep in our studio um you know they really are hugely valuable so um talking of which i was filming something the other day uh in my studio where i am now um and there i am look this is confusing <laughs> because <laughs> it's me with the chart. But anyway, there I am. And um, it was multicam. So this was a B angle. And then I had the A angle, which is basically the same as the A angle that I've got here. And um, I needed to make sure that as I cut between the cameras, that it wasn't go going to be, um, uh, you know, there wasn't going to be any kind of mismatch. Um, now that starts for me with choosing cameras that, that are faithful and, and go well together. So uh, I believe the camera that we've got here, this was a C70, I think. Ooh, the new one. The new one. It may have, it's either that or a C300 Mark III. Um, actually, it doesn't make a difference because it's the same sensor and they look identical. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, it was either a C300 Mark III or it was a C70. And, uh, and the other angle was my C200. And I just needed to make sure that there was no discrepancy between them. They're very, very close straight out the camera. But by capturing the chart here, um, I can make sure that they're 100% correct. Now, if you start expanding that, I mean, just before I came on this call, I was talking to... Um, a guy who I'm 
helping shoot something next week and he's going to have an S1H and I'm going to have an R5. <laughs> so, and we were talking about, you know, what, how are we going to match them together? And I, and he was like, Oh, can I, should we burn in a profile? Should I pick a profile? Should you make a profile for this? So like, look, we're going to manually white balance both cameras and we're going to shoot some charts and then, it, you know, a, choose a, a nice neutral faithful profile um and uh we'll do the rest in post and you know i've matched cameras that are millions of miles apart uh with these charts and you can't tell once you've done it but you it's all tied together because of these charts and the big thing that um and let me change my let me get my color grading mouse on because it allows me a bit more control um I don't know what that noise is. Is there some strange? I don't know if it's um, being picked up on the mic, but if you can hear some strange low rumbling noise, it's not me. It's uh, something coming from my desk, which is deeply annoying. Um, so yeah, these chips here. Hopefully, you can all see these. Um, these are the chromaticity coordinates for Rec Seven and Nine. And um, if I help you see, let me just get these scopes up so i normally have these scopes out i've got uh, an ipad it's actually a really nice little neat solution actually so we've, we've got uh, uh, an ipad pro you can probably see it here an ipad pro here with a little magnet on the back and that just sits and it wirelessly acts as our scopes monitor so that just sits on the desk just above my control surface and and below the uh, reference monitor but um obviously you wouldn't then be able to see it so i'm just putting the uh, scopes up uh, down in the bottom right hand corner here for you hopefully to see them nice and clearly and uh, what I'll do is I'll just focus on the Luma wish I knew what that noise was I hope you can't hear it it's deeply distracting if you're wondering why I'm hesitant um, so what I'm going to do just to isolate these chips is actually well I'll tell you what I'll start with a contrast let me just label this node uh, contrast and I'm just going to check it should be fairly good so you can see uh, where the white is there um, you can tell that the light's brighter on one side than the other. I'm just going to uh, um, take a portion of this and uh, uh, bring it in. So actually the, the brighter side uh, is on the left here. So I'm going to take that as a reference all the way through all of the different chips and get a nice big section of that. And then I'm just going to turn on my highlight mode and that would just make everything else hide. So everything else has now become middle gray um, and actually just uh, essentially disappeared. Um, and then what I'm going to do, and there's a couple of different ways I can do this. So I can do this with my curves. So I'll just do this on the control surface. Um, I can either do this with the curves uh, or I can do this with um, just my lift gamma and gain, whatever you want to do. In fact, I'll do it with my lift gamma and gain. So if I bring my lift down, I'm just going to bring the black, which is this bit here, which relates to this tiny little blob here. It's probably very hard to see this uh, over Zoom, but um, I'm just bringing that down. So it's just sitting just above zero. And then I'm going to use my gain just to bring that white reference up to around where 90 IRE would be. And then that leaves my uh, middle references fairly. Um, can you hear that noise, um, Issy? Little bit, but not really. So I think you're okay, if I'm honest. I think you can hear it more than we can hear it. Yeah, no, it's seriously loud in here. I just, uh, um, oops, sorry. It's seriously loud in here and it's. Um, distracting me um to the point where i've done that wrong right <laughs> let's bring <laughs> here. let's bring white up here and then what you should end up with is this uh middle gray it should end up roughly uh sort of between sort of 45 50 iris so it's gonna be somewhere in this kind of region and then this next this dark gray here is going to end up around the sort of 20 iri kind of area so you should end up kind of 0 20 45 50 90 at the top it doesn't have to be precise it just needs to be in the ballpark and if i take that um that little window that i just drew if i just take that off uh you can see the change now it's minimal okay you can see that actually all it's really done is just brought this up the reason why it's minimal is because I've used the chart in camera. I, I sat the chart on the seat and I've used it to set my exposure to begin with. Um, I'm also not using a, um, a log curve because it's a, it's a low dynamic range scene. There'll be no point using a log curve for this. So I'm capturing this. I think it was YDR. So um, that's why you can see that more or less, actually it's just the bright bits that are just coming up a bit. Um, and that sits now. If I did that and then discovered actually suddenly my skin was too bright or something in the room that was 
uh, bright, like say the TV screen in the background, so suddenly that was clipped. That's, that's fine. You don't need to be a slave to it. All of this, all this chart's showing you is a standard Rec. 709 spread of dynamic range. If your scene has more than that, you can still use this because it's going to show you everything that's under 100 RE where it should be. And then you just need to plot everything above that point accordingly. So you're going to have to bring down that white point until you know, nothing's clipping or potentially allow some things to clip to, so that the rest of the image isn't really squished down. You have to use a kind of a modicum of com common sense. But for this, because it's a fairly low dynamic range scene, that's actually set up perfectly. And then the next thing I'll do now that the contrast is correct um, is I will come back in here. In fact, I'll do this in a new node so that it's nice and obvious. So I'll um, create another little reference just around here. You don't have to do this. It's actually fairly easy in this particular shot to see these anyway. But I'm just going to do this just to make it a bit more easy to see. If I go into the vector scope, let's crank that up. Um, it's important that I put my two time zoom on. I don't need to turn my skin tone on. Uh, with the two time zoom on, this will fall exactly in the right place. Um, and you should, if it's a good camera, you should see that the blobs are already more or less in the right place. Now, this is, as I say, either C70 or C300 Mark III. It's one of the best cameras for kind of accurate placement of these Rec. 709 colors uh, and references straight off the bat. So I've not touched the color. You've seen I've only done the contrast. And you can see red's in the right place, yellow's in the right place, green, cyan, almost there. Blue and magenta are slightly weak in their saturation. They need to be boosted a bit in their saturation, but they're actually pointing in the right place. I'm just going to quickly do this with my curves. Um, if you've got Final Cut Pro, if you've got Premiere, if you've got Pre um, Resolve, they all have these Hue versus Hue and Hue versus Sat tools now. Uh, and all I'm going to do is I'm just going to go around just, uh, first of all, Hue versus Hue, just adjusting, uh, making sure they're all pointing at exactly the right place, which as I said, these more or less already are. Uh, and then I'm just going to go through with my saturation now, Hue versus Sat. I'm just going to make sure that the, saturate, the level of saturation is in the right place. It doesn't take too long. Let's get that there. And that's it. So you can see that those are all now sat in those boxes. So saturation, I needed to push a fair bit into the blue and magenta, a little bit into cyan and green, nothing into yellow and red. Most cameras, yellow and red, are the ones that are most accurate because those are where skin tones live, and most camera manufacturers will prioritize that part. Um, so it's not surprising to see the most amount of work uh, going in the other parts of the color signal. But you know, we're talking again, if I clear this uh, off and just turn this off and on, so that's off and that's on, you can see actually it's barely any difference, just a little bit more um, saturation going into mainly those uh, blues and magentas by come back out full screen. So that's the color off and on. It's actually making this demonstration look a little bit, meh. <laughs> but you just have to take my word for it. It's just because the camera's so good and I've exposed it correctly to begin with and I've white balanced it correctly to begin with. If I hadn't have done those things or if the camera wasn't particularly good at representing those uh, references so well, then trust me, this would look a, a million miles away from where you started. The important thing is it's, it's bringing everything into an alignment where it should live and this acts as a very solid basis. If I wanted to creatively grade this another time, uh, you know, further down the line, there's no reason why I can't, you know, start pushing blue into the shadows and, you know, any other kind of craziness. Um, but I'm starting from a known base. And if I make everything else, if it's multicam, like if I make everything else uh, attain that same base, then they can then be, uh, you know, have blues pushed into the shadows or have some kind of creative look pushed on top of all of it. And they will all go in the right place together rather than being, uh, you know, not being matched and then trying to put that creative look on top, which a lot of people do, and then constantly fight trying to figure out why they don't look the same. So it's about establishing a baseline, essentially. And like I said, if, you, if you're used to doing these things, um, uh, in camera, and if you're used to the the kind of the pipeline and the color management side of this thing, side of this, then actually you will end up in a situation like this, where once you've done it, 
you know, it's, you're not a million miles away from where you recorded, which uh, is testament to the, to the camera and also just the use of the chart. Um, and that's, that's all I need to do basically to completely balance this image with the A cam that I would have shot, which I think was the C200. Um, it looks a little bit different from this. It's not quite as color accurate as the newer sensor. Um, so there was been a, been a little bit more work to do, but the point is once I've done the exact same thing I've just done there, they will both be absolutely identical. And then when I cut between those two, as we go uh, through the edit, th there won't be any moment where the viewers sort of taken aback and like, well, something's gone wrong there or something's changed or, you know, you, you see it all the time. You, you, you know, I think we all know when we spot bad continuity and, and bad color grading, um, it's often not because a bad colorist has had a go or they've picked the wrong LUT. It's normally just because of, of problems that have been introduced through not properly understanding about white balance or about uh, exposure or about certain gammas that you're using. And hopefully what I've shown you over the course of the last hour is that this chart sits at the heart of all of that because it's that, it's that guarantee, that reference point from which you can come off from there. I've overrun massively, but um, there are um, skin references here as well. So uh, for example, if I were to sample my skin uh, here, I can start to see that the same uh, references are coming uh, and becoming selected at the same time. So you can see where uh, skin tone references fall. We can see on our vector scope that those are all falling along the correct uh, parts. I seem to remember I'd got quite sunburnt when I did this and my skin was probably a little bit pinker than it would otherwise have been. But you can see that the skin tone is all uh, correct there, which is just another verification step. Um, the other thing that I can do, oh, excuse me, my, uh, <laughs> my, I've got a piece of software that locks my computer screen uh, every, every 15 minutes. It makes me stand up and do stupid yoga poses. You've got to look after your back. That's my top tip. Um, as well as buying a chart, look after your back. <laughs> um, the other thing is, of course, we've got these uh, chips here. That you can uh, draw a little mask around these. Uh, you then get a very clear, uh, more subtle step um, in the waveform, in the Luma waveform, which is very good for if you're trying to match two different gamma curves between two cameras. You've got more references rather than just the 20, uh, 45, 90 and black. So you can do more subtle um, differences. Uh, and then the other, the only other thing we've got here are the desaturated uh, references, which you can actually see. They're the other blobs that are about halfway between the uh, blob that's sitting in the chromaticity reference boxes and the middle. And those um, actually are very useful for um, verifying that your camera is still accurately uh, representing colors in shadow and highlight areas. Uh, the DGO sensor in this camera is incredible and, and you'll see that those are all in a line. So you've got the, the termination point for the saturated box and then exactly in a line you've got the desaturated reference. Um, uh, I, I'm not going to start flinging mud and naming naming brands but there are the certain cameras that I get sent a lot when I'm grading and if you see charts if you once you terminate in the right place you actually see they curve so as they go through into the shadow areas um, and they get less saturated they get less capable of maintaining that color and they start to drift off so you end up with a curve and that's worth paying attention to because you can end up with good looking skin in like the key areas and then in the fill and shadow areas of the face they can be too pink or they can be too yellow or they can be too cyan they can end up uh, drifting uh, away. So um, if you spot that, then those desaturated chips will, will help verify that. And you can, with a lot of extra work, <laughs> you can actually then correct the color in the dark areas using keys and stuff, uh, which isn't fun, but is an extra step that you might want to take if you're trying to get a, a hundred uh, percent verifiably um, brilliant image done. But as you can see with this particular camera, um, it doesn't need it, which is nice. Right, I think that's probably enough. Are there, um, are there more questions? Or oh, let me turn my on-screen display off. Absolutely, any, if anybody has any questions, do you want to pop them in the box and we'll make sure they get an answered. But I just let me check. I think we're all good. Yeah. We got through them all, so that's brilliant. Good. Lovely. Sorry, Thank I you so much. There. 
That's absolutely fine. <laughs> Everyone's I, probably I gone for their dinner. <laughs> no, nope, everyone's still on. I just want to say a massive thank you, really. That was really good. Okay. I really appreciate it. And CBP pre- appreciates your time. So thank you very much. And thank you very much. Um, oh, quick, quick few questions. Mm-hmm. Um, can you recommend a good monitor for grading? Two of those. <laughs> I know, yes. it's one of those. <laughs> I, I can. Um, so uh, uh, people have to also understand that I do a lot of work with Canon. So I'm definitely going to put my Canon hat on just so that Canon's uh, <laughs> DP range of reference monitors are fantastic. I think I would be uh, massively um, uh, dishonoring <laughs> the truth yeah. if I was going to sit here and suggest that everyone should run out and buy one of them. They are uh, being some of the best monitors in the industry are you know, have a price tag to match. Um, if you're looking, normally the, the, those questions come with, I've got a hundred pounds to spend or I've got this much to spend. Um, if they're looking for something that's kind of not going to break the bank, um, the typical kind of monitors that um, have good color accuracy uh, and um, can be calibrated and support things like uh, internal calibration LUTs and things like that, which are useful, um, then you can look at brands like uh, Asus, um, you can look at brands like ISO, um, BenQ, uh, they're getting better. Um, they're, they're certainly getting better. Um, I think generally across the board, what I'm seeing, Dell is another good um, budget kind of uh, one. Uh, HP, <laughs> I seem to be naming all of them. Um, yeah. that, that there has been a real change in technology in recent years. And, you know, you can now get uh monitors that are much more color accurate than they used to be even you know even just the built-in displays um I mean, we're entirely mac based yeah, definitely. Here, but, you know the apple xdr display um the built-in displays even with like the imax they're they're all really good the crucial thing is to make sure that you calibrate them frequently and for that the x uh, the x right i1 display pro uh, we've got the x right i1 display pro plus um, because our, we've got HDR reference monitors here, which go up to, I think, the 1,200 nits R ones. Um, but the Plus um, I1 Display Pro will um, allow you to calibrate HDR monitors up to 2,000 nits. Um, so, um, yeah, they're, they're worth getting and, and frequently calibrating. That's, that's the key thing. Um, one more quick question. I know that um, I've just had a message that the promo code is not working. Just give me um, one minute and I'm going to have a look at that one. But while I look at that, um, um, you said that one color management workflow for log is to use the chart in 709 and then go to log. But what, are de- what about dealing with log on resolve? Thanks by advance. Thanks by advance. What about dealing with log in resolve? Um, that doesn't sound like it specifically ties to the chart. Um, that w- what I showed you just now about finding the, the white reference and putting it up at 90 IRE or the, the equivalent code value in resolve um, and plotting the next one at 45, 50 IRE and then 20 IRE and then zero, that still applies to log. Um, if I'd shot this log, I would have done exactly the same thing and it would end up looking exactly the same. Um, if they're talking broadly about just how you grade log, then that's a, that's a much more long-winded um, answer. But, um, you know, the contrast curves are your friends. Um, the custom contrast curves, you know, using these um, uh, custom contrast curves to um, carefully plot from black to white, Um, and making sure that you've got enough contrast in the middle. One of the classic things that people often make the mistake of is uh, pinning their black point, pinning their white point, and then leaving it. Um, With log, you want to pin your blacks, pin your whites, and then you really want to work quite a bit actually on on your curves, um, your contrast curves, um, to to manipulate how you're getting from that black to that white point. So if you just pin your blacks and pin your whites, actually it'll often look still quite wishy-washy throughout the middle and that's where faces are. So if you ever have anything where a face looks kind of flat and tonally a bit lackluster, it's almost always because you've shot log and you've pinned your blacks and whites, but you've not thought about how you're traversing um, that gamma. So, so essentially pushing your own curve in, which is normally start with something like an S curve, but it, sometimes it can be just pulling down the sort of a third of the way up, just pulling down the blacks. Sometimes it can be the opposite and just pushing up whites. So each different gamma curve is slightly different. And it's um, again, having these charts and particularly those um, step uh, black to whites, um, you, can, you can start to then 
adjust those curves and place those fairly precisely. Um, there should be a fairly uniform um, gap between them for a good kind of linear contrast. You know, that's all about finding a baseline. Obviously, beyond that, your creative look might call for you know, raised blacks or lower contrast or higher contrast or whatever it might be. But once you've established that baseline, um, everything creatively that builds on top of that becomes relatively straightforward. Yeah, and just to confirm, guys, because um, it's X right Ollie, not Ollie X right. And just yeah, Ollie O double L I E as well. Yeah. And then one more, um, a couple, just I'll do two more. That's okay. Yep. If you were thinking about buying your first chart, in your opinion, should I start with the passport version? It completely comes down to what they're shooting. I own a passport one and I hardly ever use it. Um, uh, or relatively hardly use it compared to the other one. Uh, the one, that last one, that one that's about sort of an A4 size piece of paper, that's the one I use all the time, uh, particularly for interviews. Um, but the passport one I find very useful when we're doing tabletop stuff, product, uh, product work. Um, and because I don't do as much of that as I do interviews, I use it therefore less. You might do something different. Um, it, it depends on how you're working. If your bread and butter is people and faces and interviews and uh, actuality, then I would get one of the, the middle size, the classic sized one, basically. Um, if you're doing loads of big landscape work, drone footage, um, if, you've, if, you use a, if you work in events and you're often at the back of a big room with long lenses, get the extra large one, which was the first chart, chart that I started. In fact, I've got it, got it here, this one, um, because that one, uh, you can see nice and clearly the bigger this appears in your recorded image or in the frame the easier it is to then see those traces uh, on the scopes to place them where you want them to be if I held up a passable one here and tried to do what I just did it, it you could do it but there'd be relatively many less pixels um, that have captured or photo sites in the camera that have captured that information and therefore it's it's a little harder to try and do it. You, you want a nice big source essentially in your in your image. So that comes down to what you shoot. And then I've got one more for you. Can X right calibrate properly as C9 LG? Uh, yes, well, yeah, you can use that probe, absolutely. Um, the plus one in particular is would be the one to go for because that allows for HDR. Um, calibration. We have a C9 here. That's the reference mode. In fact, you can you could see it in the background. Um, that's the um, client SDR reference uh, monitor that we use in our studio. We don't. Um, it's not. It's not good enough, in my opinion. It's not good enough as an HDR reference for clients. Um, we uh, it's ballpark, but we would get the clients to have a final look, either on an iPad um, or an iPhone if it's HDR deliverables that are going out online, or if it were you know something that's being broadcast, um, we would get them to look at it on our proper um, 1200 HDR reference here. Um, but yes, you can use that probe to calibrate that screen. As for the software that you do, you can either do it through DisplayCal, which is an open source piece of software, uh, or if you've got Windows, um, then I would recommend uh, the Portrait Displays uh, software. Um, it's, you know, it's fairly pricey, um, obviously compared to DisplayCal, which is open source and free, but um, it has a, they have a specific um, bit of software that will tie in for that, um, screen. So if you have the 2019 uh, or later C9, you can actually, um, uh, I believe it will actually allow you to put the calibration into the TV um, and it actually talks to the portrait display software. So, so that would be the way that I would do it that way. I think that's brilliant. That's really good. Thank you so much for this, Ollie. I really appreciate oh, yeah. it. And thank everyone seems to have really enjoyed it. So thank you very much. Um, if you have any questions, um, drop them to um, events at cbp.com. I can get them to Ollie, or um, we're going to be putting this up on Facebook tomorrow. So any questions, you can pop on there, and again, I'll get a hold of Ollie to be in touch. Nice. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, everyone, very much for turning up. And um, any questions, yeah, pop them over. Cool. Thank you, Missy. No problem. Thank you. See you soon. See you soon. Bye. Bye.